So when I'm, someone comes to me with low desire and I look at these lifestyle factors, we look at some of the other medication factors, we look at whether there's another sexual dysfunction like contributing to low desire, and they have hypoactive, meaning distressing low desire that's clinically diagnosed, and I don't see another modifiable factor. That's where in postmenopausal women, I might think, okay, do we need to add androgens, right? So we, we should say like, first you do a biopsychosocial assessment before you use a pharmaceutical. And you look at these factors, you look for relationship counseling factors, you look at referrals for psychotherapy or sex therapy, and you look at modifiable medications, other things you can change. And then if you reach the point where you're like, I wanna use something explicitly for sexual desire, in postmenopausal women, you can use testosterone. Like that's an option. We didn't talk about who the candidates are and when you would use that. The biggest hitters are people who've had ophrectomies at a young age, or early menopause, postmenopausal women with distressing low desire. Um, and then, you know, you have to, of course, do informed consent when you do that. Now, for premenopausal women who we reach the same conclusion, like there's nothing I can modify or nothing obvious, we do have two FDA approved products for this, right? And strangely, they're around and they're available and very few people when I, either they know about it and they come to me for a prescription because they've already been through everything else or they, when I tell them they're shocked to hear that that's available, right? I don't know, have you, have you heard of these? Like many people I have, have not, so, no. Yeah, interesting, right? So the first one I'll talk to you about and I'll, I'll briefly tell you about them and feel free to ask me questions. Um, would you like me just to explain what they are? Sure, yes, point? please. Yeah, so there's phlebanserin. The brand name is Addy. A-D-D-Y-I, and it was like a lot of these drugs, it was discovered, it's a centrally acting drug. It acts on serotonergic and dopaminergic receptors, and it has a complicated mechanism, which is actually not fully understood. It's mixed serotonergic agonist and antagonist. It's actually 5-H2-T-A, and 5-H2, um, 1-A and 2-A, are both agonists, Ag one's agonist, one's antagonist. It's mixed agonist, antagonist, and has activity at D4, which is dopamine receptors with mod moderate affinity for some other serotonergic receptors, 2B and 2C. And that region-specific effect seems to be prosexual. It was studied for depression, but discovered to be helpful for low desire. So, um, so kind, of, kind, of, kind of like Viagra was studied for blood pressure yeah. and found to, yeah. Right, but it, 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 this is a centrally acting drug. Yeah. So that's not to say that like women who respond to this are getting it because they're depressed, but you know, one wonders, right? I'm not gonna let, like there may be a, mm. a spectrum of like why people have no libido specifically as a presenting complaint and why a centrally acting drug could be helpful. Um, it's FDA approved. It, you're supposed to kind of rule out this other stuff and manage all the biopsychosocial factors before you consider it. That said, like you do use the same criteria used for any decision to use a drug. Like is it a, is so it a fancy. drug that a woman takes every single day, or is it so one it's that she takes daily, okay. on demand, centrally acting? It's a single dose. There's only one dose. There's no titration. A hundred milligrams. It's taken at bedtime. When it first, it's been FDA approved since 2019. It's been around. There was a long road at the FDA. I was part of that more so than the testosterone. I was there. Um, I happened to be the president of ISWISH at the t during the few years it was approved. So I spent a lot of time at the FDA trying to advocate for its approval. So I, I can tell you more what, what that struggle was like more personally. <laughs> it, um, it is administered at bedtime. Initially, they did a lot of research looking at hypotension and syncope and its interaction with alcohol. And for a few years, for some time it had a REMS we're meaning there was a risk mitigation strategy where doctors had to actually take a test before they could prescribe it. There's other drugs like that around. And s patients had to sign a form that they wouldn't drink alcohol at the pharmacy and pharmacists had to sign that they wouldn't count, that they wouldn't, um, that they counseled patients. It was re-looked at that it was really no different than any drug in class. Like SSRIs give hypotension if you take them and drink alcohol or make you feel woozy or sedated. And so it's drug in class advice now. It, it's, there's still black box because the FDA wouldn't go all the way, but it's, um, it's not anymore. It's similar in class to SSRIs. The side effects are similar. Um, anyway, you take it at night and most people you take it and you go to sleep because it does like, and it can cause a little sedation. It's sort of like mirtazapine. Mm. I tell people take it and go to sleep, right? Um, most people tell me they sleep better and they're not drowsy. You take it um, for, uh, probably you see the maximum effect about uh, four weeks, but it, usually they say give it eight to 12 weeks. Um, if it works, you continue it. If it doesn't, you stop it. Um, it generally is about as effective as an SSRI is for depression. 
it, the, the measurements in the studies are a little complicated, and we can come back to questions about that. But it looked at both desire ratings on a validated scale called the FSFI, FSFI and satisfying sexual events. And it was found to be moderately effective. But in responders, it was quite effective. Um, again, hmm. um, you use it. And what we don't know, like when you're depressed, you say, take it for 6 to 12 months, and then we stop. And we see if how they do. If there's been some neuroplasticity and re brain rewiring, and you probably know some about this. We don't have that research. So I, it's kind of needs, it's young about how long we treat for, whether we stop, and I can answer questions about that. Again, the side effects are similar to SSRIs. About 10 to 12% of people get a little, get dizzy or tired, but that's fine if you take it at night. Um, dry mouth on a handful. It's, it's relatively safe. It's no, it's as safe as any central acting drug that people prescribe routinely. Um, there are some contraindications. It can interact with CYP3A4 inhibitors and um, can worsen the side effects of SSRIs, although it's not contraindicated. Are they contraindicated with, okay, yeah. Sure. No, interestingly, it is being looked at and it is sometimes used as a remedy for SSRI-induced side effects, but SSRI-induced treatment of emergent sexual dysfunction, but the, the issue is that you may have you know augmented side effects and the patient just has to watch for that. Um, I've used it in a handful of patients. It's not my first strategy, actually. That's a whole other discussion about like what to do with treatment of emergent sexual dysfunction. We talked a little bit about just changing drugs or switching or adding bupropion. I don't do this first. Um, so that's one drug. I don't know if you want to just make sure we have time to talk about the other. Yeah, let, let's spend a second on questions. the other one. Let's spend a second on the other Yeah. Group. So the other drug's completely different. It's bremelanotide is the chemical. The brand is called Vilesi, V-Y-L-E-E-S-I. There's only, these are both the only drugs available. There's no generics out there. Um, their websites have like good information for patients. This one is um, a, it's a complicated one, but I'll tell you about it. It's a cyclic 7 amino acid melanocortin receptor agonist with a high affinity for what's called the type 4 melanocortin receptors. And it, it's an analog of MS, MSH, which is melanocyte stimulating hormone. And what it does in, in the end is it acts in brain pathways that stimulate dopaminergic pathways. Um, and it's, so it's a direct hit for desire, right? The other one mm. is a little more complicated in like, like cooking, you know, <laughs> you're like sprinkling a little this receptor and that receptor. This one hits the dopaminergic pathways. It's given on demand as a self-injected treatment. Injected. So you get, yeah, so it looks like an EpiPen a little bit. Mm. You have to look at a picture on the website. I wish I could hold one up. I actually should have hold the trainer up. And you stab your thigh. It has a fine little needle. Yep. When you stab, it releases it. It's um, very painless. I, you know, I, I can tell you I've tried dummies and patients tell me it feels less than like a finger stick and less than a PPD. And how long does you know, it take to... Uh... So you inject 1.57 milligrams, which is 0.3 mLs of a solution, subcutaneously with this auto-injector into like your abdomen or your thigh, like a thick muscle. And it takes about five seconds to go in. So you say one, two, three, four, <laughs> you know, and then you pull it out, right? You can also see that the liquid's yep. gone down. You can look down and see it. Um, it's a little scary for women, but it doesn't, you don't feel But I'm sorry, you, you only take this drug when you want so to have sex. So it's done on demand, yeah. right? So what's the theory? So you should take it about 45 minutes before, and it's considered on demand, one-time use, self-injected, and it lasts in your body presumably about 24 hours. That's the theory. And what happens is that women will say, like after a little while, they just feel more like, the idea seems more interesting. Their brain, this is where this bridge between desire and arousal comes. They start to feel like, hey, you know, I'm feeling kind of interested and turned on. And then when they engage in the activity, the arousability is wow. more intensified. So it's supposed to be intra-event improvements and overall sense of satisfaction. And that fits into that idea that it fuels the future. Like they know like, hey, I might be neutral or not even interested, but if I do this, I'm going to feel more turned on and the experience is going to be more pleasurable because I'm going to feel more into it, both mentally desirous and probably arousal. How much does this and drug cost? So they're both of these. So they're, Fulbanserin is um, available every, everywhere. Brevalanotide has a specialty pharmacy that you can see on their website. And put it this way, if your insurance doesn't cover it, both of them have guaranteed maxes between $40 and $90 per month. For Fulbanserin, you get a 30-day supply. Hmm. For this, you get a four-week supply from the specialty pharmacy. And it depends, like many insurance companies don't cover this, but they guarantee a maximum. And you can- Does it need you, to be refrigerated? To, no, you keep it on the shelf. I think just in a cool, dry place. Wow. And 
the take up, so the, the outcomes on this, there's one ca- thing to know about this. The outcomes on this have been pretty much, there, there's no head to head studies between the two, but pretty good. And they looked at both like improvements in this desire rating scale, the FSFI, as well as clinical events, like satisfying sexual events. And clinical meaningfulness has been good, good, moderate to deep, solid outcomes. I can give you numbers if you want for all of this. But the main thing with this is that the first couple of dose or two, people get nauseous. It's about 45% of people. The nausea lasts about two hours, about 40% of people. And that tolerates out by the second time it's down, the data suggests it's down by about somewhere around 20 to 40%, it's up to 40. And then it's down to about 8%. And then most people don't mention So, so do you nauseous. advise that women maybe use it a couple of times without trying to have sex so or that they you, get over the you, nausea? Or you can go to sleep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because most people, if they're sleeping, and then it's supposed to, and like in the mornings, do people notice that they still, like it does sort of last mm-hmm. for at least 12 to 15 hours, maybe even 24. Um, or just lay down. You can give it, some pe- per- people prescribe like a dose of anti-nausea pill with it for the first dose um, or for a couple of doses. I don't find the nausea is that clinically problematic, but if people have it, they're like, it's over in a couple hours and it didn't happen the second time. If you put aside sort of cost, insurance, or... Uh, hesitancy so, with uh, an injectable versus a pill. If you put all those things aside as non-issues, how do you decide which of these two drugs might be more appropriate? So one thing is patient preference. They're probably there's no head-to-head trials, but they're probably equally effective. Okay. Um, you know, do they want it on demand? The other one is so. The other thing about this I want to mention is this a, was a rare occurrence of focal hyperpigmentation, focal hyperpigmentation, about 1% in the clinical trial when they used it more than eight times a month. But we tell people probably to stick to four a month to limit that risk, right? And sorry, so it was, f- hypopigmentation at the injection site or just in no, general? face, gingiva, hmm. breast, like melanocortin, melanoreceptor, sensitive tissue. Wow. And it was in the clinical trial and it was seen in 1% of people. Um, it's not clear if it goes away if you stop it, but if you don't use it beyond, it's not thought to occur if you don't use it beyond the recommended guidance, right? They say that backwards. Use it yeah. less than yeah. eight times a month and it probably isn't going to happen, yeah. but we have to tell people that. Interesting, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. there are two contraindications. So you get to who do I, so the two contraindications for this are uncontrolled hypertension or known cardiovascular disease because there was small increases in blood pressure, about eight to 10 millimeters of both systolic mm. and, high, and diastolic. It's probably not. Like it's probably overkill. It was originally studied as an intranasal and it did raise blood pressure, intranasal squirt, and it did raise blood pressure more. Wow. So they switched to the injectable. And there were some trials on this in men and some of my male colleagues like think about how this might be used off label for an array of male sexual dysfunctions, but it's not it. This is, so the other point I wanna make is there are a couple of, at least one good large RCT in postmenopausal women. You should, you should have asked me, why is this not approved for postmenopausal women? So this has to do with the FDA again. The FDA required that the companies go for indication of a category, because this goes to the reproductive group of the FDA, and they required either that they put in an application for either pre or post. So they started with pre, so they didn't have to deal with all the hormonal complications of like hormonal status, hormonal replacement, and never went back for post. But, but is, it, company, is it is it typically given or prescribed off label for post? So there's da- so here's what I say: there's good RCT data for postmenopausal women that's very strong that suggests there's no difference both in outcomes and risk and safety, and no RCTs in in uh, that's for for for, for, for Lancer, and I'm sorry there's no RCTs for Vilesi for Addy there's there's postmenopausal data for for, for Addy none for Vilesi. So you're in no man's land if you're prescribing this off label for postmenopausal women, but there's no physiologic plausibility for the risk. But you could give Addy and testosterone to postmenopausal women without contraindication. Well, um, if you're doing off label, off label, yes. Right? <laughs> well, you're and yeah, I don't yeah. usually start with two. I, I'm a I'm a purist. I start with one thing. Yep. And either layer or switch, yep. and that's a cl- that's a, that's clinical skill, really, or it's clinical art, right? Yeah. Like, what do you? But there's um, I have I have multiple. They tend to be younger postmenopausal women who are on Addy and understand. And I have them clear informed consent, understand it's off label, that there's research supporting it. I don't have not used Vilesi in postmenopausal women that some of my colleagues my colleagues have because I, I just I'm up I'm up like a like you know nervous that there's no data, and I just don't we it there's no biological. Are these are these uh, are these Schedule Four? Are they controlled or uncontrolled? 
they're not controlled. Testosterone is. Yes, testosterone is, yeah. It's a D, you have to have a DA number, it's controlled, you can only give a month at a time, which is easy for women because you give them a box of 30. <laughs> yeah. There's no, that's no man's land, right? They get 10 months, but. Um, so these were, again, they were proof for premenopausal women purely because the FDA in their reproductive group required that they go for one indication. The companies didn't go back. Um, there, um, the other thing, how do I pick? So one thing is patient preference. The other one is any contraindications. So the CYP3A4 inhibitor issue um, is a problem for flubanserin. If someone's on other psychotropic drugs and I'm worried about oversedation, I might not choose that. Um, if they have to be on like a lot of, they're on HIV drugs, for example, like CYP3A4 inhibitors, they're taking a lot of antibiotics or diflucan. You have to wait. There's, there's guidance about how long to wait in between all the CYP3A4s and that's a nitty gritty. We probably don't want to get into at the moment. Liver disease is another relative or strong contraindication for flubanserin because it's a metabolism. So Vilesi would be a good choice in those cases. Um, if someone has high blood pressure or they have like aversion to getting nauseous you know, for the first time, I mean, it's a, it's a discussion. Mm -hmm. um, some people are terrified of injecting themselves and it, it's really one, like people do it. They're like, it's no big deal. Uh, but the, you just have to know that and tell people that. <laughs>